No, no, you're Yeah, I hope I get too. We're going to call the legislation meeting to order. Mr. Clark, would you please call the roll? Alderman Kennedy. Alderman Boyd. Present. Alderman Howard. Present. Alderman Hubbard. Alderman Murphy. Here. Alderman Ogilvie. Alderman Navarro. Present. Alderman Middlebrook. Present. Alderman Vaccaro. Present. President Reed. You have six presidents, Mr. Chairman. You have a okay, so the the uh, board bill in front of me, but the one pertaining to the fire fires portability, we're pulling that one for today because there's still going to be discussion on yeah, one forty two. So we're going to pull that one for today. Uh, I think what we'll do is let's go to uh, board bill seventy two. And I believe that, uh, Mary, you're going to speak on that? Um, Tom is, and he was literally right Tom, <laughs> okay. Tom's going to speak on that. And oh, Hey, Tamika, how are you doing? <laughs> Tom, you're going to speak on this? For yes. Us? Okay. Yes. Sorry, I'm, but, so, well, yes, we're on board with oh too. Yes. Does everyone have a copy of the bill in front of me? Yes. Chairman? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> uh, I want to first just pass out a copy of this email we received back in August uh, relating to this issue. And that is, this is a, an email from Charles, Charles Bryson, who's the head of uh, CREA, Civil Rights Enforcement Agency. Uh, it, the, uh, the email at the, the bottom, if you look from the bottom up, yeah. uh, the email states that someone has filed a civil rights claim with CREA based on disability and public accommodation. Uh, I would like to set up a time in the next few weeks to see if solutions can be reached. Uh, this doesn't go into detail within this email, but what this email was related to was uh, someone who's um, hearing impaired that when watching the board meetings, they could not tell what was going on in the board meetings because we did not have any uh, effective way of communicating that through, uh, closed you know, closed yeah. caption is what, you know, commonly referred to. Um, we have a, another email here uh, that was from, uh, and we met with uh, uh, Mr. Bryson during this time. We had conversation after this email also with the communication division of the city of St. Louis uh, in regards to how we fix this problem with the broadcast that we have. Uh, subsequent to that email, we had an email from Alderwoman uh, Rice, sent an email to our office as well, advising us of a constituent of hers, I believe. Um, around, uh, you know, solving deficient accommodations for people who are hearing impaired. Uh, he had a constituent reach out um, about his attempts regarding his inability to participate in the board meetings. Um, you know, sum it up. You know, due to him, you know, hearing impairment. Did everyone get a copy of this email? No. Uh, okay. There weren't copies. I don't think so. There it comes. Come on. Um, and in it, uh, you know, in her email, in the second paragraph, she states, "Right now." Um, all SCO TV does is rely on YouTube's automated closed captioning, which is wholly insufficient. So we, we had some conversations. We need to go. Oh, you still have one. You can go. If they need you for public safety, Alderman. We just got one thing to vote on. That's this. Um, boy, did they, they might need some public safety. 
on the boys on public safety. Yeah, but that's fine. Well, we, this is the only bill we really have to vote on. Yes. So what we'll do is, as soon as we vote on this, then we'll go over. Probably we'll, we're we're going to vote on this pretty fast. Okay, they have a quorum? Oh, uh, don't they remember. don't, and then they will. We'll go over Scott. Okay, well, I'll try to move fast. I'll try to move fast. I had subsequent conversations with David Newberger, um, uh, STL TV, the communications division here in the city of St. Louis. And at, after the, you know, so we want to solve this problem, of course. We, we want people, everyone to be able to participate in the legislative processes that go on at the Board of Aldermen as well as the meetings of the Board of Estimate and Apportionment and the Preservation Board. So um, some years back, the board had previously um, passed an ordinance that required the video audio recording of the Preservation Board meetings, the Board of Aldermen meetings, and the Board of Estimate and Apportionment meetings. What Board Bill 72 does is um, amend that section of the code to also include uh, video recordings and effective closed captioning of recorded meetings and meetings that are broadcast live. So that's what Board Bill 72 does is put in the city code that, we re that we're required to provide effective closed captioning of recorded meetings and meetings that are broadcast live. Uh, there was a fiscal note attached to the Board Bill is that attached to yes, the board in front of you? And I got this information from the communications division about a, um, equipment that can be purchased, which will uh, provide them the ability to do that. The language for um, effective closed captioning, um, you know, I talked about that with David Newberger and also there in the email that we received from him. Uh, we took some of the language from some of the uh, requirements, legal requirements on, um, you know, open government. Mm -hmm. So that's what this board bill would do. It's, it's a uh, fiscal not, I think, it, you know, between forty-five and fifty thousand dollars for the equipment, and this will allow uh, the hearing impaired, it better allow the hearing impaired to know what's going on at our meetings. We can go down the list, but otherwise I'll just ask. Does anybody have questions? So we're going down the list then. I'm sorry. All right. Alderman Boyd? Sure. Um, so there is a federal law that requires us to do this. Yes, there's a federal law. And if you look at the email from Dave Newberger, unless we can show that it is fiscally just a, a great oh. burden for us to do it. Okay, I see it. Okay. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, otherwise. And the other you know, question is, is the money available for appropriation so I, that we I, can actually implement this? Uh, there's not an emergency clause in the board, so we wouldn't have to do it immediately, mm -hmm. but I, I, I feel confident that um, it, through either Ways and Means Committee or the Board of VNA that we can find forty to $50,000 to... Um, allow these residents to um, fully follow what's going on with city government. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Um, now this machine, do you still need a person to do like the court reporter to type in what's being no, said? No, the machine, the machine. The machine will, transcribes will, the, yes. the audio. Yes. Okay. That would so, be the, that would be a one time cost for the machine. Because that's what I was thinking. The forty five thousand would be for the machine. The mm -hmm. machine would handle the for the equipment. That would be yes. on the screen, mm -hmm. and we wouldn't have to employ someone. Exactly. Okay, that's what I was wondering. I thought, do we have to employ someone to operate this? Machine? No, it wouldn't call, require a full time person. Yeah, to I was, uh, that's right. what I was So no, I'm fine. With that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Hubbard. No questions, thank you. Uh, Vice Chairman Scott, thank you. Thanks. Um, maybe you know the answer, but is there is there currently like a lawsuit that the city is involved in on this subject? And I, I know that there was a, a complaint filed with CREA. Okay. I haven't um, okay. I haven't been informed that it's progressed to a lawsuit, but it's, it's 
definitely a possibility. Um, and I assume we have to we have to bid this out to get to buy this equipment. Um, to do the supply commissioner, uh, that's possible. It would be the communication division buying. It wouldn't be the. It, it, this is not a responsibility of the board of aldermen per se. It's right. city yeah. government. So either the communications division, yeah, would put out uh, uh, requests for proposals on the information or the supply commissioner. Okay, I don't have any other questions. Alderman Navarro? Thank you. Um, I think this is a good idea. I mean, not just for people who are hearing impaired, but for anybody viewing these, I think it helps to have the caption mm -hmm. available. So I appreciate this, this effort. Um, one question I have is, is there any, and I don't know that this is feasible, but is there any sort of verification of what's appearing on the screen? Like, is there any sort of quality check after the fact to make sure that what is being said is what's being reflected on the screen? Um, I, I'm sure there could be. Uh, I don't think it would be. Is that, <laughs> is that up to us? Huh? So is that up to us to go back and say, wait a minute, is that what I said? Well, it seems like it would be the communications division. Yeah, I would leave that up to them. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think that would be beneficial, especially if, you know, if you're looking at this stuff on your phone and you're relying on the... Yeah, they should probably audit. I, I would think they would audit sections of it or something like that. Um, I'm sure, you know, with any technology, there'll probably be a word or two. Sure. It gets, yeah, but, I, you know, we, we can request, you know, that they audit. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think we need to codify it, but we can request that they kind of audit it. And then, time to time. was there con uh, comparison or consideration of open captioning versus closed captioning so that it, it would be available without having to go in and choose closed captioning? Um, no, no, there was not discussion about that. Uh, closed captioning is it's kind of the language that was uh, used from the beginning of the discussion. So that's the, you know, okay. that's what we moved forward with. And I believe that was um, in, in the conversations with. Newberger and the communication division, that's the language. Okay, that's what they recommend. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't I don't think I have any other any other questions. Okay. All the women Middlebrook. No questions. And all the women rice. Thanks. Uh, I'm really glad that this is coming forward. Um, the as to a lawsuit, there was a threatened lawsuit. Um, and that's part of why I moved quickly to try to bring this to the president's attention, the mayor's office and all of that. Um, so can you tell me, I, I thought that, I, and I haven't seen the fiscal note attached, but I thought that Ways and Means had allocated the money this last budget go around so communications already has the money that they need for it's it. It's possible. Okay. And if they do, we should, yeah, they should. Okay. So we don't, this, this may not be an extra 40000 on that. I think, because if, if I remember correctly, my conversations with um, Frank Williamson, with Alderman Williamson were that, that did go ahead and go forward. So this may not be an extra expenditure of this much. If they, um, yeah, I don't think when the budget was passed, they had money that was strictly set aside for that okay. equipment. Okay. I don't believe if there's been some action taken in ways and means since then, it, okay. it's possible. All right. Um, um, I, that, that, and then I, my one other question that I had with it was. So the meetings that we have lined down in here are the Board of Estimate and Apportionment, the Preservation Board, and the Board of Aldermen. Do mm -hmm. we not have authority to do any of the other boards? Or uh, so like we, Board of Public we, Service or I, I things would, like that? I would say, uh, you, uh, I think we, yeah, we, we have authority. Um, this, and that would probably be for a, a separate board bill to okay. require recording of them and everything. Okay. This was amending uh, the code that currently that. just deals with those three. Okay. So, I th yeah, a subsequent or a different board bill that includes more bodies, uh, the meetings of them to be recorded is definitely within uh, the board's power. Okay. Um, yeah, I think this this is a good this is a good step, and everything else is financially difficult. It's difficult to financially have an interpreter for someone who wants to attend a live event as well. They can't participate right now, and that's a challenge. But that's a huge fiscal challenge for us as a city too. Um, that should be something that we should maybe look forward to in the future, but I think this is a great first step um, to have that availability. So, um, thank you. I'd like somebody to do signing. Does any, I want to add my name to the bill. Does anybody else want to add any yes. the bill? Yes. Uh, anybody? Scott. Anybody? So, everybody in the room, Scott's, mm -hmm. not Scott, just 
Yeah. You're right, Dr. Reams. So anyway, uh, anybody want to make a motion that we pass board bill? I make a motion that we pass board bill second. second. And a second. second. We got a second. Uh, man, oh man. Please call the roll. Sure. Alderman Kennedy. Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderwoman Howard. Aye. Alderwoman Hubbard. Alderwoman Murphy. Aye. Alderman Ogilvy. Aye. Alderwoman Navarro. Aye. Alderwoman Middlebrook. Aye. Chairman Vaccaro. Aye. President Reed. You have seven aye votes. Okay. So, I know Jeff and I'm going to go over. Scott's going to take over. But I do want to make a comment. Uh, I want to thank Scott. Because I know he's not rerunning. And the committees will change a little bit after, I guess, next week. Scott has been stellar. I've been out with this hard stuff. Scott has taken every meeting. Uh, cherish him as a vice chairman. I wish he wasn't leaving. I wish he would continue to run because uh, you know he's really smart and he's a great vice chair. And I did not want to leave today because in case there's no other meeting without personally thanking Scott. Uh, he's probably run more of the legislation meetings than I have. And mostly, like I said, the last eight or nine weeks of my life has been a disaster with this heart masses. But anyway, thank you, Scott. I wish you would consider, Thanks, reconsider and run. Welcome back. <laughs> Okay, next up, um, uh, resolution 124 is before us. Uh, so, Ms. Reese and Mr. Shepard, you are, uh, you are welcome to proceed on resolution 124. Thank you. I'm going to pass this out. Do you guys have a copy of the resolution? I do. Yeah. Thank you. I do. I'll pass this out to you. Yeah, here's an extra. I've got more if we need them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. For a minute, okay. Awesome, thank you. So as you remember, back last September, we passed Resolution 124, which was unanimously passed by the Board of Aldermen, which commits the City of St. Louis to 100% clean energy by 2035. So we wanted to give you guys an update on what we've been doing since then. So that's what this little presentation is about today. So the first thing we did was we formed an advisory board. We have several, several of those members with us here today. Emily Andrews, Reverend Roderick Burden, um, Craig Abishan serves on our technical committee, Bruce Morrison, and then Andy Knott here. He's our chairman of the subcommittee for the technical committee, and he serves on the advisory board as well. There are two other technical committee members here, Andrew Linares from Renew Missouri and Henry Robertson. Perfect. From so there's a lot of experts here. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask when we get to the end of this. So we started off with our advisory board here. They include people from environmental groups, clergy, education, medicine, all different groups, and they're all volunteer. So we have to thank them for all of their time because they have spent hours and hours on this project and they will continue to do so. So since we've adopted this board, we've identified a set of goals and recommendations on how we're gonna move forward to the develop the plan that's called for in Resolution 124. Um, for the past several months, we've been meeting with various stakeholders in the community. We've met with Anheuser-Busch, we've met with Amran numerous times. Um, the uh, Sustainability Office for the City of St. Louis, one STL, and we're continuing to meet with other groups throughout the city. Several of these um, businesses have already committed to these types of goals, so we're kind of learning from them as well. We've also been working with other cities to see how they've done this. Atlanta has a great plan, so we've been working with them to see what worked for them, what didn't work for them, um, Cleveland, and several others. So we also formed a technical advisory committee, which Andy oversees. 
Um, and that handles the really specific data and numbers and things that people who aren't in the environmental sector really don't get, like me. It goes way over my head. Um, so they've been also doing similar things like that, identifying potential tools and strategies that could be used to meet the goals of Resolution 124. We also just recently formed a community engagement committee. So with that group, you'll be seeing a lot of stuff come out from them in the next few months. So the, the goals that we have adopted are cost effectiveness, health, equity, and jobs. So for cost effective, we want to meet electricity needs of consumers in the most cost effective manner possible or should lead to cost savings for consumers over the life of the project. For health, we want to improve local health out outcomes and health impacts associated with the generation of electricity. Equity, ensure equitable access for low income communities, communities of colors, and other traditionally mar marginalized groups. And jobs, we want to create additional employment opportunities for residents that meets or exceeds the city's required um, MWBE requirements. So we're using those as kind of our guiding. Sure. Um, the next uh, the next page uh, goes over some of the tools and strategies that the technical committee has been looking at. Um, and first of all, the, the broad goals of Resolution 124 will likely be met with um, a combination of first looking at how we get citywide operations to go to 100% clean energy, uh, and then secondly, how can we uh, encourage that across all city users of electricity. Um, and there are multiple tools uh, and strategies that can be implement, implemented today uh, to meet the, the goals of the resolution, and those are listed on the, in the table on the right. Uh, energy efficiency, the city has a fantastic energy benchmarking program, uh, which we'll talk a, a bit more about later. Um, we can be participating in Ameren's energy efficiency programs, and uh, we could collaborate with uh, an energy services contractor. Um, also solar, uh, the city owned rooftop solar uh, can be procured with Ameren rebates. I think there's actually a project in motion now to do that with the, the, um, the Catherine's working on. Um, and there's also the possibility of participating in community solar that Ameren is now offering. Uh, and then uh, lastly on wind energy, there are a couple of options. The city could um, participate in Ameren's new green tariff program for wind energy, which I'll mention again in a little bit. Uh, or also just go out and find an, a contract with another provider of, of wind energy. Uh, the next page is a proposed schedule uh, for the next uh, nine months, um, and uh, eight or nine months, and um, uh, essentially the, for the next three months, the technical committee is going to be doing some uh, work on analytical methodology and more technical analysis in the spring. The, the uh, Public Engagement Committee is going to be doing public outreach and getting public input, <coughs> surveys, things of that nature. And we'll be coming back with a draft uh, after that uh, to bring to the advisory board and eventually getting a final report to the full board of aldermen by August 1st. Um, this, I think this next page is, is really a, a testament to how um, this movement towards <coughs> clean energy is playing out, both in the city and in the region. And it's, it's, there's a lot of things already happening that are very exciting. Uh, the, the biggest thing, the most recent thing, is that, again, thanks to Catherine's work uh, in, as a sustainability uh, director, uh, the city was selected as one of 20 uh, cities under a Bloomberg climate uh, grant uh, to receive a little over $2 million to work on these kinds of issues, uh, energy, clean energy and other sustainability issues. So that's a huge <coughs> thing for the city of St. Louis. Uh, the city also signed a pledge uh, that earlier this fall reaffirming the commitment to re reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050, uh, and the city has completed its first year of energy efficiency benchmarking, uh, which enrolling a significant percentage of all commercial buildings over 50,000 square feet. So the city's been making a lot of progress in 2018. Um, and then uh, Ameren also has been making progress. Um, uh, the, um, the first two I just want to mention that are directly related to Resolution 124 is that um, you may recall 
uh, when this was adopted last fall, that Ameren said publicly, they were quoted in the, in the Post-Dispatch as saying that they supported Resolution 124 because their customers are demanding clean energy already, uh, and they want to help, help their customers meet that. Um, they also last fall uh, uh, requested permission from the Public Service Commission to adopt a green tariff program. This is where customers like the city or large uh, industrial and commercial customers could uh, procure wind energy through Ameren. Uh, when they requested that permission from the Public Service Commission, they actually cited Resolution 124 as a reason for why they needed to have this program. Um, the other one uh, that just happened in the last few weeks is that the Public Service Commission adopted a rule directing Ameren to uh, consider Resolution 124 when it does its long-range planning. Uh, and once a plan gets adopted by the Board of Aldermen, then it has to consider it in great detail. So, um, so these things do make a difference, um, uh, and it just, shows, it just shows how the Board's actions have resulted in some real progress at Ameren, I would say. Um, a few other things, uh, Ameren's provided more than $5 million in incentives to uh, new rooftop solar programs, uh, and also proposed, their, I think it's their largest energy efficiency program uh, that they've ever proposed. So um, that's pretty much it. Uh, the last slide is just a summary of our next steps. Um, also, uh, St. Louis was featured, this photo is from a Sierra Club uh, report. Uh, Sierra, uh, St. Louis was featured as one of 10 cities that have made progress in the last year on this on these issues. So with that, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah. So really, you'll start seeing a lot of community engagement. In the original resolution, Resolution 124 asked for a December 2018 deadline. We could have met that deadline, but we would have rushed. And we wanted to make sure we had ample amount of community engagement. And when we started talking to these other cities, we realized how large of a project this is. And so we want to make sure we get it done right. So the letter we passed out to you is just requesting an extension on this resolution to August 2019, which we outlined in the presentation, explaining how we're going to meet our goals. So we're really looking forward to it, and we appreciate your support. So with that, if anybody has questions, we would be happy to answer questions, or any of the experts we have here. Sure, we can go through the committee. Um, Alderman Howard. Um, so do we need to amend the resolution at all? Or the resolution, I don't see a close date on it. Is that? We're not really here to do that. We're just here for the report, correct? Um, the, the resolution, which has you know, already passed in the second read, had a December uh, 2018 uh, deadline for a report. Oh, okay. And so we're towards the yeah, bottom so, there. So just as far as, for the, as, far as the, uh, the task force's due date for a report is what um, an extension is being requested. So we have the plan. Correct. Okay. okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Alderman Murphy. Um, just a, a question. On, yeah, I was just looking at these um, cities that are highlighted. Are those the only other ones doing this? No. Or what's the story there? Um, I, I think it's more, more than 75 cities. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This was just a report uh, for this year of cities that have made significant progress. So they, we selected 10 of those. For this report. St. Louis was the first in the Midwest to come out in support of this, and so we kind of got a lot of great attention for that. Okay. that, that no questions. Just, thank you. No more. Um, <laughs> Navarro. Thank you. Thank you. I'm thrilled that this is moving forward this past, I think, on my, my first board meeting, so <laughs> it was very exciting to be here on that day, and I just want to thank everybody who's been working on this. I know that you've taken this on in addition to all of your other responsibilities, um, and you're doing this, you know, for for the city on our behalf. So thank you very much for all of your time. I do have a few questions. Um, one regarding the community engagement piece of this. Can you talk a little bit about how that is being undertaken? Yeah. So we just started outlining kind of our plan, and we talked with other cities on how they did it. So what we're thinking, and nothing's really set in stone, but what we're thinking is several community meetings, um, large like town hall style meetings along with like stakeholder lunch and learn. So we would have the environmental group come in and talk through. Then we would have your business owners come in and talk through your clergy and so on. Um, we also would have a survey. In Atlanta, they did this and they reached out to, I think it was like 
5,000 or 10,000 people just from the survey results. So we want to make sure we have a really good survey that goes out. And we want people to feel involved in this plan. We don't want to create the plan and say, okay, here's the plan. This is what we're doing. We really want community engagement. And we also want to use it as an education portion of this. A lot of people don't understand why this is important for the city of St. Louis. Some people do, but a lot of people don't. So there's kind of twofold to this. So we would love to have your support and your participation in that as well, if you would like. And I remember we sent out a survey last yes. year when we were kicking this off. Do yes. you remember how many respondents? Um, I think it was like 250 respondents Okay. with covering several different groups. I think it was like 20 different groups mm -hmm. um, being involved in this process. So we're keeping those people in mind, too, when we send out this information. Okay, yeah. And has the, has the chamber gotten involved with this? Are they being supportive in any way? We haven't specifically reached out. I haven't specifically reached out to them. Um, there is a, there, there have been, there's an energy efficiency uh, con, uh, consulting firm whose name I'm going to forget who's part of, um, who's been somewhat involved in this in terms of, so yeah, Sitton, yeah, not directly, but they're aware of that. And, and Sitton is, uh, I think, the chair of the Chamber's Energy Committee, so certainly they're certainly aware of it. We have not had them come in and meet. Right. Great. And so are we at the point yet in terms of um, kind of the goals around health and equity? Um, I guess those are the two big ones in terms of identifying the measurables mm -hmm. for for those or where in the process are we with identifying metrics for those sorts of things? I think more for the technical. No, anybody up from the committee want to answer that? <laughs> yeah, I think where we are is, is yes. We're, there's going to be metrics we're going to be able to do that. When we put clean energy onto the grid, we're going to displace other power plants that emit pollutants. We can figure out how to take, we can use some publicly available models, we can figure out how those pollutants turn into avoided health care costs. So we'll be able to show how an investment by the city in this resolution is going to lead to like actual lives saved and actual money saved at the hospital to the benefit of all. So that's going to speak to the health goal. Um, in terms of the equity goal, we're going to be able to look at what this does to people's utility bills and how utility bills move around around the region to make sure that it's fair for everybody. So those are the types of numbers that we'll put in there to support the investment that you all are making on, on behalf of the residents. So, so thank you. Great. Thank you. Will that also, the equity piece, will that also include um, looking at where certain upgrades happen or where there are Im improvements, you know, whether this results in you know, this many more solar panels? Are we going to be looking at where those are distributed throughout the city? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Because I think that's another, another piece of it is you know, who's involved in the, the infrastructure right. um, and how that's being distributed. Yeah. Right. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about, and I was going back to the resolution to see, so I know I, Amron, I, they know, I applaud that they are making steps in the right direction, which I know we've all been waiting for for a long time, so that's wonderful. Um, is this group, are you all looking at, at gas as well? Has Spire been in, engaged at all? You know, they're doing a lot of upgrades right now. Is that is that a piece of this? Is this just looking at electricity? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. We're just looking at electricity. Okay. One note to that is Spire has a number of robust energy efficiency programs. So uh, in terms of the city's natural gas heating mm -hmm. demand and things like that, that's going to be a part of the energy efficiency recommendation that, that we look at. Okay. Yeah, because they have, yeah, when you think about heating, that's a big piece of it. Um, okay. yeah, and I, I think, you'll see on the first slide, the other thing we say, and it's really important to keep in mind, is, is this resolution is one of many strategies that the city's going to undertake to meet its broader sustainability. So what we're doing on the electricity side is going to be a really big part of that. Um, the report might touch on, but not make recommendations about how you might meet those sustainability goals through the other other sectors like natural gas or, or buildings or, or vehicles. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, do we know yet with the the Bloomberg money, that $2 million, do we know what that technical assistance specifically looks like? That would, I would leave that up to Catherine Warner. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Or. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the $2 million from uh, Bloomberg, do we know specifically what that technical assistance looks like? What will they be providing? Uh, yes and no. So it is not actual dollars. It is technical, technical assistance. Yeah, right. So um, it will be a city advisor. And that uh, job description is being worked on now. We hope to bring that city advisor on sometime around the first of the year. Um, and then the scope of work 
we have proposed in our application what the major components of the scope of work would be. And then uh, there are basically three different uh, avenues of support from Bloomberg. One would be the city advisor's time, mm -hmm. what they're actually working on. Another would be they have a bench of technical resources that Bloomberg has already retained, folks like NRDC. Um, they've already um, have these firms that have, are being paid by Bloomberg. And so, uh, the, so far, this is very, very early in the whole stage. Uh, we're going next week for the grand kickoff, so we'll learn more next week. Um, but the, the, my understanding is that we would tap into the folks that Bloomberg has already retained to ask them to help us deliver or study or whatever it is that we have proposed in our um, scope of work, our work plan. And then the third thing is there might be a wee pot of money, and they have been emphasizing very, very small, that the Bloomberg folks, either through their technical advisors or Bloomberg, would then um, hire folks, maybe like U.S. Green Building Council, some local firms to help us do things through our local partners, Missouri Coastal for the Environment, or for policy, environmental and policy, but whomever it might be, it would be paid through them, but they have emphasized over and over again that that is a very, very, very small amount of money that might be available for that purpose. So we would still need to get funds to make upgrades to city buildings, for example. Like, so we'll, we'll get technical assistance in terms of, and, and it, there's advising and there's planning and all of that, but actual money to, to make upgrades and no. that sort of thing is a, a completely no, it, separate Yeah, piece well, it, down the road. in some respects we can propose um, Helping to helping us to identify financial strategies. So, for example, like solar energy, all of these. I don't even know what's in there, but I mean, some of the things that I've been considering it, it requires financing. Right. So, right. what is the best way? Where do we? Um, how do we develop these things? So, tapping into their technical resources to help us figure out where we're going to okay. find those technical uh, financial resources okay. to implement. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um. Well then, I'm I'm just curious to hear from anybody on the committee what other resources are needed. I was in LA recently at the National League of Cities, and there are cities that have very robust departments around climate adaptation and renewable energy upgrades. And I know you all are taking this on in a volunteer capacity. I know we've got Catherine, um, and we'll have you know an adv advisor. But what else, from your perspective? do you think that we need at the city in order to be able to carry this out effectively and be the leader that we say we want to be in, in clean energy? Well, it's, it's, yeah. it's holiday time, right? Yeah. So throw yeah. out your wish. <laughs> I, I don't want to I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think as part of the community engagement strategy, I think it's going to be exactly what you, you just mentioned, Catherine, which is figuring out the nuts and bolts of how you take the plan and you translate it into action. So figuring out the financing. Um, and so that's less a wish list. Like we're not going to wish for money, right? But it's like it's like following Catherine's leadership to say, how do you actually turn the plan into into new solar panels, into new energy efficiency, signing new contracts? So it's going to be working with with you all to figure out, you know, what is the process around uh, funding and budgeting and, and, and paying for things. So you know, we have the technical assistance in the room, you know, the experts to figure that out. And so I think that's going to be part of the engagement process, figuring out how to make it work. Yeah, and uh, in Virginia, they have a training center to train people how to do efficiency. And so one of the things that I think would be great for our city and for this, a lot of the savings really would come from efficiency. Mm -hmm. So if there's a training center that would come out of this that would be able to train people in our communities, especially our distressed communities, mm -hmm. uh, where there's no investment in North St. Louis, to train them how to do efficiency and then deploy them throughout the city so that we can meet our goals. So. I believe that's something that could come. And if we state that while our consultants and highly skilled and smart people, if we put that forward, that that would benefit the city, especially areas that are underserved. Great, that's a great idea. And then the last thing I would say is, um, uh, you know, there's been a lot of work done. The technical committee's done some really good work on assessing the kind of the rough first estimate of the potential for rooftop solar for all city buildings and energy efficiency for 
city buildings and these sorts of things. And once the um, technical advisor, or the, the uh, city advisor for Bloomberg comes on, or there was talk of another technical consultant hiring, I'm not sure if that's replaced by the Bloomberg consultant, but once that person is in place, um, if there could be like just an understanding of clear communication between the work that the, the people who've done, already done some work and the work that's going to be done to plug <coughs> things, um, that, that clear line of communication I think would really be helpful just in order to not lose the work that's already been done. And just kind of clear communication in, in general to the, to the residents and businesses in the city that this is important. You know, I think, um, I mean, I think that's where the community engagement piece comes in, but just, you just have to keep saying it over and over again, um, you know, that, that it's important and, and that there, you know, this is a, a bigger picture. Um, we may not be addressing immediate needs, but this is a long-term issue. All right, one last question. Um, we often see when St. Louis tries to do something forward thinking, uh, there's something that comes out of Jefferson City that stops that. And do you all see anything? Are there any barriers in, in that realm that we should be looking out for to make sure that we can implement this? I'd say that we, we hope not. And I think a, a big part of that is because Ameren is sort of on this train now themselves. And I think you know, we would see opposition. You know, if we were going to see opposition, it probably would have come from the, the large utilities. I suppose that um, Peabody could try to do something, but um, it has not, we have not heard anything about that. So, but I mean, Ameren is really pretty much on board <coughs> with moving this direction. Um, so we think, we think that we should, we hope we don't see anything from Jeff City to try to reduce this. The, the one thing that uh, could present an issue is there's there's a constant drumbeat from the utilities to revamp the Missouri net metering statute, which allows you to exchange your excess solar production with, with the grid. So that that's one thing to watch out for is that's constantly a thing, and we expect that to come up again this year. But in terms of the other things, Ameren has been has really turned a corner. Efficiency, large scale renewable programs, uh, they're excellent. So we should definitely be taking advantage of that. They, well, they still burn a lot of coal. We still have to, but right. <laughs> but at least right, they've turned. I, I say they've turned the corner. They have not sped up yet. So they're yes. they're, uh, they're looking in the right direction. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. Great. One, well, thank you. And, oh yeah. Emily. Just to follow up on that, one recommendation that we've talked a lot about at the technical committee um, and at the full board is that um, if the city were more involved at the state level, like with the public service commission. Yes. Um, that could go a long way, I think, in kind of protecting what we're doing here. Um, and it's important that, you know, that the largest cities in the state are, you know, yeah, are advocating bad. for efficiency and renewables yeah. at the state level as well. So that's one. Well, yeah, definitely, I mean, it's an opportunity. Finding some time for someone at the city councilor's office to keep track of what's happening at the PSC in Jeff City. Yeah. And an example of what the technical committee is doing to support that is can't under, understate that the important work that Henry and others did getting the PSC to ask Ameren to include this issue in long range plans. Right? That's yeah. that's Jeff City taking us seriously. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's Ameren taking us seriously. And as a technical committee, what we're gonna do is put forward a really serious report. Right? That that is of the quality that can participate in that conversation alongside Ameren's experts. Uh, and, and so I think that's a good example of how the work we're doing is going to feed into that type of process. Great. Well, yeah, call on us if we are needed to advocate PSC and Jeff City. Please, thank you for keeping us up to date today, and I'm happy to help however I can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Alderman Middlebrook. No questions. questions. Okay. Um, okay, I have a couple questions. Um, so I think it's important to clarify that the resolution is just dealing with electricity consumption and generation. Yes. Um, the, the thing, the place where I get hung up on this is, so what is, what is Ameren's legal obligation 
right now? Like, like what percentage do they have to provide in terms of renewables in their electricity mix in Missouri? It's 10% at the moment, but in 2021 it goes to 15% sales. Okay. It's at 15%. And that's what I want, to, I want to be careful too. That's what they're legally obligated to do, but their business interests are pointing towards more of that. And so they're building additional renewables that are outside the scope of that 15% right now. And they're doing that to serve customer demand to the, in their best interest um, of their customers and their shareholders to do that. So they're, they're headed, you know, in a different direction. Right. So my, I mean, I, I could, I could envision a scenario in which the city is able by 2035 to generate or purchase 100 percent of the electricity that the city uses or the equivalent from renewable sources but we can't control what the other like the public does right and the only way that the residents of the city of st louis are going to be consuming 100 percent renewable electricity is if that's what amrin provides and if amrin is not providing 100 percent renewable electricity generation by 2035 then you know, you know, the goal of this resolution is not met. So I, I just, I, I quibble on what the, um, what the intent of the resolution is, I suppose. Um, I mean, I'm, you know, I've participated in Ameren's Pure Power program for 12 years or something. So, I mean, I'm personally like 100% behind this, but I, I just think, I, I worry that we sometimes confuse the public, because when this passed, I got tons of phone calls saying like, what does this mean? Does this mean I have to put solar panels on top of my house, or what happens if I don't, you know? So I worry that the messaging around this confuses the public sometimes about what is actually, you know, what the resolution would actually require, and, and the reality is a lot of this is just going to come down to what cameras electricity generation mix is, right? Is that, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're not, we're probably, we're not gonna get uh, like retail choice passed in Missouri so that you can choose who you buy your energy from in the near future, not with the current legislative makeup. So, I mean that, so, so I think it comes back to sort of the, the, the principle that, that goals matter and that these goals help push Amron in that direction. At least they help push, uh, and with like with um, what Craig was saying about the the Public Service Commission adopting this rule, saying that Amron has to consider these things, and and also just you know getting the city more involved in those Public Service Commission proceedings. This could all help push them in that direction. I mean, it, it will. It's not going to be easy, um, but you know I would say that these goals matter, and they do they do help. Um, sort of pressure Amarin in the right direction. And I'd, I'd also add that it's, I mean, it's really important feedback on what the communication yeah. piece is going to do. Yeah. And you'll, you'll see, like, we've already started to talk about the report is going to make recommendations in two phases. One for city operations and things that, that you do have direct control over. Yeah. And another more long-term indirect measures that you don't have control over. Right? Speaking to your exact point. And, and so one of the reasons for the extension is so that we can take that message out and, and educate mm -hmm. all of us on that. Because I mean, you raise like a really valid insight, um, and, and we're trying to speak to that. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I just I I don't like when we like when the coverage around these things confuses the public about exactly what our sort of legal authority is. The city, we don't have the authority to tell consumers what electricity they should buy or not buy. So. Um, so that's sort of my only point of concern. I guess, so my other question then is, is the resolution is what it is from, from last year. Right. We're not amending the resolution. We're just, we don't really need to take an action as a committee, I don't think. We're just, you know, we're just saying thank you tape. for coming and presenting what we'll call maybe a preliminary report mm -hmm. and the full report will be, we'll look forward to it yep. next year. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, um, are there any other questions from the committee then on, on this report on Resolution 124? Well, we uh, thank you everybody for coming, and uh, we will look forward to the full report in another year. Um,
Okay, the next thing on our agenda uh, is Board Bill 136, which is uh, sponsored by Chairman Paro, who is currently in another committee hearing. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Demetrius Alfred into the hot seat. Good morning. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll so I'll do a brief introduction. Uh, it looks like. Board Bill 136 uh, creates a definition for what a recreational fire is. So like uh, if you have a fire in your backyard and you put s'mores on it, um, that's a recreational fire. But it sounds like we don't have a definition for that right now within our uh, municipal code. And so maybe that leads to some issues when people burn things that um, like a huge pile of leaves or like building refuse or something that might be uh, might be a nuisance or dangerous, and we want to be able to distinguish between what a, what a you know backyard fire is and what just burning trash is in, in the backyard. So, without further ado, absolutely, Mr. that's correct. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to the committee. Uh, I wasn't prepared for this, so you guys got to bear with me. But I am. Uh, we should probably introduce Mr. Alfred as president of Local 73, 73. Firefighters. Firefighters Union. Yes. yes, yes, and and, the, and firefighters. Yes, and uh, again, thank you. Uh, looking at the board bill, uh, I got a call from the sponsor to uh, look into some things, and so I am aware that this bill was coming about, and it, uh, we support the bill. Uh, it seems that the ordinance that's currently in effect uh, uh, doesn't cover as much as it should, if you will. To, uh, like uh, Alderman Ogilvy said, um, doesn't identify uh, what should be burned and in, in, in the portions and things like that. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Fire department get calls about uh, burning barrels or smoke in the yard and things like that. We show up and people could be burning piles of leaves, which we believe is uh, uh, against the law. Mm -hmm. We'll put those out. But there's other instances where there's buildings being torn down where the workers have a burn barrel that's just a warming barrel in, in temperatures like today that uh, we might get into uh, an argument with them. We may say, well, okay, you can have a warming barrel, but it shouldn't be super big. It should just be the warming barrel. And then there's other instances where we have uh, citizens that are burning things continuously in their backyard in a barrel or in a rock pit, if you will, and they, they know that what the ordinance says and doesn't identify it, and they try to tell us, well, the ordinance say it's in a pit and I'm just burning and I got to control. And they'll tell us, hey, you can't put this out. And we've even been on a situation where the police has been called and the ordinance has been told to them and nobody can do anything. We believe this board bill here is narrowing the scope to identify uh, certain things, recreational fire, what can be burned and what cannot be, be burned. So I think, I think there's a need for this and I believe that's what Alderman Bacall is attempting to do. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Alfred. Yes, sir. Uh, we will take questions or comments from the committee. Uh, Alderman Howard. I think this is a good thing because many times the firefighters are called to fires that become recreational when you're called. Yes, <laughs> yes ma'am. Yes, ma so I think this will kind of let people know what is expected in a recreational. Do you have, I mean, is there a, a constant call for these, to put these out sometimes when they get? Yes, ma'am, uh, hmm. especially in the winter. But in some areas, and I don't want to outline anybody, but in some areas, there's some things going uh, year-round. Uh, like I said, there are some citizens that know the ordinance that uh, kind of use it to their advantage to burn things instead of putting it in the dumpster and things general. like that. Yes. Disposing of it properly. A absolutely. And, and, and like I said, Alderman Bacaro is aware of that, okay. and those are the things we're trying to uh, curb. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Alderman Murphy. 
Yeah, I can uh, just want to reiterate what she said. I'm glad we're defining it better. I had an incident like this too, where someone decided just to burn a bunch of sticks or whatever that they had cut from a tree, but in an open area in the backyard, and it kind of went, you know. So I'm glad that this is being defined there. Now, um, what is our obligation uh, to let everybody know about this? How could we do that? Well, you know, I mean, I know we can say things at meetings, but so we don't have you called constantly. And, 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 that, and that's a great question. I don't want to step on uh, Alderman Vergara's okay. toes, but sure. from the fire department perspective, yeah. uh, once this is passed, uh, we would like to be notified and, and possibly maybe we can come up with a campaign, mm -hmm. you know, to, to let the, the, the citizens know. But more than that, I, I'd like the fire department to know and disseminate the information throughout every firehouse because, you know, it's, it's nothing like showing up on a scene and being told from a, yeah. an, an informed citizen or a, a citizen to think he's informed that, hey, you can't do this. Yeah. And then we get in an argument with him, we have to call the police. And then whoever you get, let's say it's a young officer that may not know the ordinance, now we're at a stalemate. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, th there is some type of uh, uh, information we'd like okay. to give out. But I think if you give it to the fire department and, and let it, give us permission to come up with uh, some way to inform not only all our guys, but maybe the neighborhood, I think we I think sure. we'd be able to do something like that. That's what I would like to see. Thank yes. you. That's no more questions. Okay, Alder Woman Navarro. Thank you. Do you know what the, the ordinance number is? When, no ma'am. It would be really helpful to to know like what's on the exactly what's on the books right now because this is defining a specific type of fire and it just makes me curious about all the other types of fire where you do burn rubbish, leaves, grass, paper. I would have to leaves. refer to the clerk. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Sounds like we've got it in two places, both in the fire code and in the uh, health code. It sounds like the health code essentially prohibits all burning yeah. without um, a specific exemption for sort of, you know, backyard fire, mm -hmm. um, campfire, yeah, that, that style of fire. So I think, I think by, I suppose by carving out a specific sort of campfire type fire, it makes it easier to distinguish other types of fires that are actually prohibited or potentially dangerous. Yes, and, and the way you said it is, is actually perfect, because that's, that's kind of what the problem is. Some of it's in the, in the fire code, which we use to you know govern certain buildings and things like that, but the other's in the health code. And when you have, a uh, let's say, an average citizen that knows that, then I'll say, no, you can't do that. I have this protection. Right. You know? right. And I think that, that hits directly to the point that this narrows the scope to cover the problems that we're talking about. <clears throat> okay, so this is saying a recreational fire is something so that's not in a fire pit or fire outdoor fireplace. So I mean, I'm, I'm reading this thinking, okay, if I just want to yet yeah, burn a fire in my backyard, I've always done it in you know a little fire pit mm -hmm. structure thing, but and I because I just thought that's a really bad idea to not do that. <laughs> But this would say a recreational fire is one that, and that would be a recreational fire, is what we're saying, that you could just pile up logs under four inches in diameter and burn them in your backyard. Yes, as a recre and like a, recre a recreational fire in a pit that, you know, we like to do around the holidays. But what we don't recommend is that, it, you know, it, let's say, I hope I'm not confusing, your average citizen does that, let's say, on the weekends or after dinner or something And you're like saying that. without but, any sort of outdoor fireplace or fire pit, just yes. on the ground? Yes. Okay. And, but th there's been times when we have people who will take the pit that we buy at uh, uh, the oh, Home Depot, yeah. and they'll fill it up with mm -hmm. stuff. And you come by and you say, uh, is that a warm pit? Yeah, that's a warm pit. Mm -hmm. But if I come by tomorrow night and the next night and this thing is loaded again, mm -hmm. you know, you're trying to get rid of waste. Right. And, right. and we, when we know that, but they're using, they're using the code, you know, to say, okay. no, this is what I'm trying. That's what we're trying to eliminate, stuff like that. Okay. okay. And, and uh, by the way, if they're doing it one time and then we look over here and there's a gigantic pile of stuff, 
Oh, I'm not putting that in there. Yes, you are. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So right. we're just trying to get control. It, it, it's more of a nuisance to the to the neighbors. Oh, sure. You know, and it's and it's a little dangerous, but it it's it's come about so many times you wouldn't believe that we're trying to address it. So essentially we're getting at the people who are using the outdoor fireplaces to to burn when they shouldn't. I guess I'm reading this though to say that if you're burning it on the ground that's a recreational fire and as long as you follow these rules you can do that which I mean why would we allow anybody to burn something if it's not in some sort of container well I, I think the, I'm not sure how that's written but I think that would refer to like when we have these some people call these burn pits with just bricks around and things mm -hmm. like that. And that, in our opinion, that's okay. If okay. you got the bricks lined up yeah, and means, maybe three or four stacks yeah. high, but the ground is the bottom plate. I think that refers to that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I, I, I would like to look at this a little bit more because I do think it is a serious issue. I, I, guess, some, I guess another question that I have is... Um, so if somebody's concerned about, you know, the smoke coming from, um, you know, excess, we've got number four, excessive or lingering smoke or odor emissions. Are they, do they call the fire department to enforce that? Do they call the health department to enforce that? I think you're going to call us the fire department for okay. any smoke showing. Okay. I believe if this is passed and, and we're, we're brought up to speed on it, we'll be able to say, well, we will call it because of this. Are you going to, you know, we can put it out for you, or mm -hmm. are you just about done because we need to get rid of the smoke because there's a complaint, just like mm -hmm. any other time. Okay. And if we come out once and that's one thing, they calm down, cool. Mm -hmm. If we get called again or again, then we have the right to come because of this and just put it out mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we've had a complaint. Okay. May I? Um, I was just going to speak to... Sure. Yes, oh, please. The 28th. Understand that sometimes people use these fires to clean scrap. Oh, yeah, I, I would like to restrict people <coughs> who make fires. Like, I'm not trying to. Yeah. And now we've, you know, all went to this recreational yeah. having the fire. Pit right, right. You know, we went from crazy. having fun to now I'm going to sneak under the radar. And, right. and, 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 and I know where you're going. So this may not do enough, but I think it narrows the scope. And, and, you know, we give it a try. I don't know how we get it to work. I mean, do we just say, hey, no scrap, or who's, who's identifying scrap? Right. You well, know what I mean? I'm, I'm thinking, like, what if I do my fire in an outdoor fire, a portable outdoor fireplace in my backyard, and it is causing smoke and that's bothering my neighbor, that's not, it's not considered a recreational fire under this. So that, that's what's confusing to me, is that if I do my fire in a fire pit, it's not considered a recreational fire, and it's not subject to this. Is that, am I reading that right? Well, or maybe that's covered in the ordinance somewhere else. Yeah. I just don't have the, I, I, the ordinance yeah. in front of me, so I don't know. <laughs> I'm uh, <coughs> I'm comfortable with us holding this so we can get a look at the other ordinances just to make sure everybody is, is comfortable mm -hmm. and understand maybe really how they the interplay between them. Absolutely. Um, I just don't, I don't want to leave loopholes, you know. And I think yeah. it's important for it to be clear because I would think my my portable backyard s'more fire is a recreational fire, but according to this, I don't, I don't think it is. So that, think According to this, I think it is. But it says where the fuel is not contained in an incinerator, outdoor fireplace, portable outdoor fireplace. Yeah, I mean, it's if saying, I'm, if I'm reading it's saying your s'more fire, you know, your campfire on the ground is a recreational fire, mm -hmm. as long as it's right. small and not enormous, and it's, it's away <coughs> from structures that it could light on right. fire. Right, but once I put it into the portable outdoor <coughs> fireplace, it's no longer a recreational fire. Yeah. Yes. I don't read that. But then I think it's probably governed by... Right, so maybe it's governed by something else. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this says a recreational <coughs> fire is where the fuel is not contained in a portable outdoor fire place by the grill or barbecue pit. So that's that, probably covered somewhere else, other but I don't, shape. but I, it would be good to see how these fit together <coughs> so, that, sure. so that it's clear. That's fine. I'm, I, okay. Given Thank the you. circumstances here, we can, we can hit pause on this one until we have a little more clarification. Absolutely. Thank I you. Apologize, for you. we didn't even get to Alderman Middlebrook on this one. Do you have any? Do you have any questions? I do um, not. <laughs> we can investigate before we come back to this one. So, okay, uh, we will.
consider, we'll take no action on Board Bill 136 today. I have a motion we table. Board Bill No, we don't want to table. Don't want to table it because then we got to untable it. <laughs> um, we, can just, we can just put it back on the agenda okay. uh, for the next meeting. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I move we adjourn the legislation today. I have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank I welcome the opportunity to come back and help, guys. And oh, yeah. I'll, I'll